<laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for our brother James, Joseph, Joseph James, that uh, today is going to give us the word. Father, we, we pray that you, 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 give, you give him, you use him um, as a vessel, Father, to deliver your message, Father. And we also pray that uh, nothing is going to hinder him, Father, that he's going to be courageous, Father, to touch every aspect of what you have prepared for us, Father, that you are going to speak through him, Father, that he's, he's going to sit aside and you are going to lead every word that is going to come out of him, Father. And for us who are going to be uh, listening, Father, that you are going to touch our hearts, Father, that uh, this word is not going to go in vain, Father, that all of us are not going to live here empty-handed, Father, but we are going to be transformed through your word, Father. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, they, uh, I would like to dismiss the youth. Have a good time. Thank you. All right, I'm going to get all my papers ready up here while, we're, while the youth are leaving. All right. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. First off, let's clap for all of our people back there in the sound and audio booth. It's been a rough morning for you guys. I know that nobody ever notices when you guys do everything right, but when there's struggles, it's like, here's everybody facing it. The second something goes wrong, you see like 90 heads whip around and look at you like it's your fault. And I was one of them. So, uh... It's okay, it happens. I'm probably gonna get some of those looks while I'm talking today, but um, no, thank you guys very much. It is true, it is a thankless job you do back there, but we appreciate it. So today I have some slides, oh, there we go. All right, it's hard to see, man, okay. Is that, is that it? That's not what I'm seeing. Okay, it, put it onto two separate slides. All right, I always have issues whenever I try to submit a PowerPoint, but it's okay. We will work with whatever pops up up there, and we'll, <laughs> we'll figure it out as we go. Um, uh, this is your guys' fault, though. Um, no. <laughs> How can Christianity be true? We're continuing on in our series of tough questions. And so the question for today is, how can Christianity be true when so many Christians are judgmental. How can Christianity be true when so many Christians are judgmental? Um, and the title of the sermon was the first slide. It was supposed to all be on one slide, but it's uh, discerning to judge. I have a feeling these are just gonna keep falling down throughout the sermon, but I'll just, uh, you know what? There we go. Um, so how can Christianity be true when so many Christians are judgmental? And this is kind of can be a confusing topic because it seems like when you look through scripture, you'll see one verse that says, you know, don't, don't judge. And then in another verse, you'll see one that says, talks about judging others. And so it can be confusing. Even Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, in one verse, he says, uh, don't judge. Then just a few verses later, he talks about how we need to judge false teachers. And then uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 12 talks about judging others. And then in Romans chapter, four, chapter 14, verse 13, he says, Let's not pass judgment on one another. So is this a contradiction in the Bible? Uh, is this some, you know, they didn't quite know what to think about it, so they put both points of view in there? No. The simple answer is no, right? But I think that when we see this, this, this idea, you know, don't judge, and then a verse about, about judging, uh, it's a, a clue to us that this is an area that needs to be handled, handled with gentleness and compassion, and there may not be necessarily one correct way to handle every situation. Uh, so anyways, like I said, it can be a difficult and confusing idea. And I think we need to look 
at our definition for the word to judge or judgmental and then look at scripture, see what it says, of course, and then we can even look at the, some examples that Christ himself gave in this area. I think the most common verse used nowadays is probably Matthew 7.1. When I was growing up, I think it was probably John 3.16, right? So, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was probably the big one for me growing up. But I think in like the last few years, there's been this shift to Matthew 7.1. I mean, I, I, I hear it in song lyrics. It's on like... I don't know, I'd imagine thousands of Instagram and Twitter posts and comments every day. And because Matthew 7, 1 says, judge not that you be not judged. And so even the lost are a big fan of this verse because it it seems to give a a pass, if you will, for you to do whatever you want and, and not receive any judgment. So can Christianity be true? when so many Christians are judgmental. There are two main views held, like I said, we need to look at our definition. So there are two main views held when it comes to judging. Uh, Some people think that it's wrong, uh, that it's judgmental or wrong to make any kind of moral judgment at all. Uh, Sadly, I would say that this idea is actually on the rise, partnered with the concept that there are no absolute truths. And so, but I think that most of us can look at that concept and, and, and see the, the, the problems with it. Uh, because if there are no absolute truths or you cannot make any kind of moral judgment whatsoever, then if someone wants to steal, that's okay. Because you can't make any kind of moral judgment against that person. If someone wants to kill someone for any reason, that's okay. Because we can't make any kind of moral judgment against that person. Uh, the same goes with objective truth or absolute truths. Two plus, you can tell me that two plus two equals four, right? But if, if uh, since there's no absolute truth, sorry, um, I say two plus two equals seven because it's my favorite number. So to a lot of us that seems silly and doesn't make any sense, but that is actually something that is being taught in universities and schools today. Uh, However, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that viewpoint because I think that the majority of us would agree that nations and societies would almost collapse into a state of complete chaos if that was the viewpoint held by the majority of people. So I'll move forward with the idea that most people contend that moral judgments are okay, but only if done in a certain way and to certain people. However, for a Christian, um, I like to use the word discerning. That's why I titled this Discerning to Judge. Uh, When judging is done properly, and like I said, I prefer to use the word discerning when it's done properly, um, uh, it's it's, it's not judging because when when I'm wanting someone to discontinue a certain practice in their life or I disagree with a behavior when it is handled, with love and compassion, instead of a, a hostile, holier-than-thou kind of attitude, I'm actually bringing it up out of a love and compassion for that person. And I'm desiring them to be able to live out John 10.10, 10, which is when Jesus said, I came that you could have life and that you could have it more abundantly. So we're discerning that that action or belief is harmful for that person because it is taking away from God's best for that person. So, that being said, I want to look at some of the difference between someone that has a judgmental attitude, and I want to look at uh, between that and someone that has a discerning attitude. But first, let's look at the definition of judge. So let's see if this pops up. There we go. That's it. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Judge uh, to express a bad opinion of someone's behavior, often because you think you are better than them. To express a bad opinion of someone's behavior often because you think you're better than them. And this is actually from Oxford English Dictionary. So this is, you can see even in this definition the negative connotation that goes along with judging someone. So um, let's go ahead and, and look at the first characteristic of a judgmental person. And for that we're going to look at Matthew 7, 1 to 5. Matthew 7. Verses 1 to 5. I apologize. I'm going to... I'm doing a lot. We're going to be 
going a lot through scripture today, and I've only got one hand, so this might be a little tricky. But Matthew 7, 1 to 5, and then we'll look at Romans 2, verse 1. Matthew 7, 1 to 5. And we're going to be going through scripture a lot, so uh, I don't have all the verses. I apologize up on the board like we usually try to do, uh, because it would have been a ton of slides. But uh, if you're unable to keep up, feel free to just write down the references and go back and, and check them out later. So Matthew 7, verses 1 to 5. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. There's the, the, the favorite verse. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And then let's look at Romans chapter 2, verse 1. I apologize. Romans 2, verse 1. That says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one who judges, for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. So, just a quick reference in Matthew 7, 1 through 5. When Jesus is saying, judge not, he is speaking specifically to the Pharisees in this part of his sermon because the Pharisees were judging in a way that they thought that they were somehow almost determining people's eternal destiny. Like they thought they could, could, could judge everyone because they were so holy. And then they looked at everyone else and were like, well, not you, not you, not you, not you. Like you're not doing this, you're not doing that. And they thought they were actually somehow determining people's eternal destiny. And Jesus is saying, that no, you are not the final judge, I am. It doesn't matter how holy you think you are, I am the one who gets to determine, not you. So, but then he goes on and he says, talks about the log in their eyes. So, and then in this verse we talk about, we see in, in Romans 2.1, the, the very same sins that we're often uh, calling out in other people are the very sins that we are struggling with ourselves. So before we start making corrections, in other people's lives, we need to make sure that our own affairs are in order. We don't, need to, we don't want to be like the hypocrites, like the Pharisees. We don't want to be hypocrites. We want to make sure that we seek God, making sure that we have taken care of our sin in our own lives before we're going out and pointing out every sin problem that we feel our brother or sister may have. So the first one was they failed to see his or her own faults. And then let's look at the second characteristic of a, of a judgmental person. Makes judgments on opinions, hearsay, and personal preferences. Makes judgments on opinions, hearsay, or personal preferences. And for that, we're going to look at John seven twenty four, John chapter 7, verse 24. John 7, 24, which says, Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And then Romans 14, 10. Romans 14, 10, which says, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So we are not to make judgments on opinions, hearsay, or personal preferences. We saw in John 7, 24, the, the it, not judging on appearances. It's so easy for us to look at somebody and think that we understand them, that we get them by, by the way they look alone. And the Bible saying, do not judge by appearances. Do not judge on opinions, hearsay, or personal preferences. If you go on to read in Romans 14... Uh, it would have taken a lot of time, so we didn't get to read it. But Paul talks about this concept of clean and unclean things. So there were some people that were still holding to the concept that there was unclean things. And Paul says that there is no longer clean and un unclean. But he gave, um, two, uh, he gave two, two, uh, two lessons that we need to learn from that. He he said, there is no longer clean and unclean, but we're to be thoughtful of someone who still harbors that conviction of 
clean and unclean things. So the two lessons we need to learn is, is one, that we are to seek the best for others, even at the cost of some of our personal preferences. And that's in Romans 14, 22. So maybe you're with somebody, and you know they struggle with something. In this situation, it was meat. So they were, he was saying, if you're with someone, and they still harbor those feelings of unclean things, don't go in front of them and eat something that was considered unclean. Care enough. Don't put a stumbling block in front of your brother. And the second thing is, is that we as believers are not to judge others based on their personal preferences. Understanding that there is freedom in Christ. And that just because you're convicted of something and your neighbor isn't, doesn't necessarily mean that they're sinning or that it's a sin. We, some of us have our own personal convictions and there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to have personal convictions, and it's actually wrong for you to do that thing if you have that conviction. The Bible talks about that. If you have that conviction, he taught, in this case it was clean and unclean things. He was saying if you have that conviction of clean and unclean, and you're going and you eat something that's unclean with that conviction, then you are sinning because you have that conviction that it is wrong. So, but also we are not to judge others that may have a different point of view on something that isn't clear in Scripture. So we have to be careful not to call things sin that, are, that may not be sin, and we can't judge based on personal preferences. So, so far we have uh, characteristics of a judgmental person. They fail to see his or her own faults. They make judgments on opinions, hearsay, and personal preferences. And thirdly, they seek to publicly expose. And for that, we're going to look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 1 to 11. John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. It's the story of the woman caught in adultery. Uh, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people who came to him, <clears throat> sorry, all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. In placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw the stone at her. And once, and once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Jesus said, I mean, she said, No one, Lord. <clears throat> and Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. So, three characteristics of a judgmental person. They fail to see his or, own fault, his or her own faults. They make judgments on opinions, hearsay, and personal preferences. And thirdly, they seek to publicly expose. In this story, I think it's pretty clear what these men's motives were. They were trying to, to cause problems for Jesus. They, they were trying to get, be able to bring some charge against him. But on top of that, they brought her to the most public place possible. They did that to try to bring shame on her and to boost their own egos. We can often do similar things to people. Uh, we hide our motives a lot better than these guys did. Uh, we can make it seem like we're concerned by the way we word things, but we're going and we're sharing with other people. We say, I'm just, I'm just really worried about him because of this. But deep down, we want this person to feel the same way that that woman felt. Uh, we want them to be embarrassed. We want them to be ashamed. We want people to know that we would never do anything like what that person is doing. We are, we are being like Pharisees. We are judging, putting ourselves in the place of God, thinking that we can decide people's fates. And somehow elevate ourselves uh, by displaying and many times almost rejoicing in other people's sins. 
So, the three characteristics of a judgmental person, they fail to see his or her own faults, they make judgments on opinions, hearsay, and personal preferences, and they seek to publicly expose. Let's look at the definition for, for discern up here. So we had judge, right? To express a bad opinion of someone's behavior, often because you think you're better than them. And to discern, to see, to recognize, or understand something that is not clear. To see, to recognize, or understand something that is not clear. So let's now look at three characteristics of a discerning person. Go ahead and go to the the next one there. Characteristics of a discerning person. First, he examines his own life first. He examines his own life first. And for that, we look again at Matthew 7, 1 to 5, which I w- actually, let's, let's go ahead and read it again, actually. Matthew 7, 1 to 5, it says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And quickly, let's look at 1 Corinthians 11.28. 1 Corinthians 11.28. It says, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And we hear this, this verse often when we take the Lord's Supper. But let a man examine himself then. We are to examine our own lives first. And the craziest thing about this, this, this picture that it gives us in Matthew chapter 7 is the eye is not a big body part, right? It's pretty, pretty small. And so it's saying that he, they have a log in their own eye. And so literally... It's giving the picture that we are blinded by our own sin. We can't even see. We're, we're, but yet, we're in our blindness, we're reaching and still trying to see the faults in others, despite the fact that we are completely blind. And we're saying, let me, let me help you. Go ahead and try to help somebody get something small out of their eye with your eyes closed. I'm sure they would appreciate that. That is what it is saying, though. We are so, so blinded by our own sin, but all we can still see is the sin in our neighbor's lives. So, a discerning person examines his own life first. The second one, they check their motives and their facts. They check their motives and their facts. For that, let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5.21. 1 Thessalonians 5.21. I have shaky hands, so it makes this extra hard one-handed. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, it says, But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Test your motives. Why are you confronting this person? Why do you have these feelings towards this person? Is it a problem in your own life? I think that many times when we have problems between us and other people, if we truly look at it, most of the fault lies in our own hearts. So this verse says, test everything and hold fast to what is good. If it's not good, let go of it. Next, let's look at Proverbs 14.25. Proverbs 14.25, which says, The simple believes everything but the prudent gives thoughts to his steps. The simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thoughts to his steps. Check your motives and the facts. Don't be simple, right? Don't be simple. The Bible says the simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thoughts to his steps. So let's go ahead and look at the last characteristic of a discerning person. Deals with people privately. Deals with people privately. And for that, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. 
So the three characteristics we have are examines their own life first, checks their motives and facts, and deals with people privately. Matthew 18, we're going to be in verse 15, and we're going to read through verse 17. It says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So, the Bible gives us clear steps for how to address someone that has sinned against us or that we know that is living in sin and that is a believer. We first go to that person alone. If that doesn't work, we bring two or three others and we go and we approach them again. And if that doesn't work, then the leaders and the two or three that others that came with us can then handle it as a church and bring it before the church if necessary. However, I feel like we can't discuss a judgmental spirit without bringing up another issue that usually goes hand in hand with a judgmental spirit, and that's, the, the, that's gossip and slander. So if you would go ahead and go to the next slide. Gossip. When we discuss matters with someone who is neither a part of the problem or the solution, when we discuss matters with someone who is neither a part of the problem or the solution. Slander, speaking poorly of someone with the intent of hurting their reputation. Speaking poorly of, of someone with the intent of hurting their reputation, even if what we're saying is true. Even if what you're saying is true, if you're doing it to hurt their reputation, that is slander. Maybe you feel like somebody's wronged you in this church even. Or you're unhappy with someone in this church or, or a co-worker. Um, and you go and you tell your friend about it. That's gossip. Does that friend, in any, are they a part of the problem? Are they in any way going to be a part of the solution? If the answer is no, then that is gossip. Maybe you're thinking to yourself... Well, I don't know if it's a big enough deal for me to go and talk to that person. I don't want to make it a bigger deal than it is. Well, then let me assure you that if you can't go to that person and talk to them, then it's not a big enough deal for you to go and talk to anyone else about it. We don't get that privilege. If we are not willing to go and talk to the person one-on-one, -on -one, then we don't get to tell others about it. And we don't get to anyways, but... We, we often hide under this. I don't, I don't want to make it a big deal. No. If you are telling others, you cannot do that. You have to go and address it with the person. We as believers have two options when we feel someone has sinned against us. One, we look it over in grace. And that means we forget it. Right then. We don't get to hold it over the person's head or demand anything from them when we were not willing to go and address it with them in person. Uh, re, re, go with me really quick to Proverbs 17.9. Proverbs 17.9. All right. Proverbs 17.9. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. So, we can choose to look it over in love, as we see here in Proverbs. And then in Proverbs 10, 12, it also says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. So we can look things over in love, but maybe sometimes that's not right. Maybe someone is, is living in sin and it's a constant thing, or maybe this has happened multiple times and you feel that you need to address it with the person. The second option is what we already talked about with Matthew 18, and that's to go to them in person and tell them how they have sinned against you. And for that, we have clear instructions, right? You go by yourself at first and address it with them. If that doesn't work, you take two or three others 
If that doesn't work, then you, the, you allow the leaders from the church to handle it from there, and they can then bring it to the church if necessary. There is no third option. We don't have a third option. We don't get to go rogue, gossiping, and slandering someone. Let me encourage you that if you have been gossiping or slandering against someone, find them as soon as possible and ask them for forgiveness. Matthew 5, 23 and 24 talks about if you are at the temple and you're about to give an offering to God and you realize there's something between you and someone else, stop right there. Leave your offering. Go and find that person. Get things right with that person and then come back and give your offering to the Lord. So I encourage you that if you have been judging and gossiping about someone, get it right. All right. We can exhale now on to the back to our question. <laughs> you can go to the next slide. There we go. So how can Christianity be true when so many Christians are judgmental? All right. I agree that the number of people who claim to be Christians yet are almost unashamedly judgmental is disturbing. And I know that I'm bothered by my own prideful tendencies to want to judge others at times. However, I would humbly contend that while judgmental Christians are definitely a poor advertisement for Christianity, it doesn't invalidate Christianity itself. Because as we saw in Matthew 7, 1, when Jesus said, judge not, he was talking to the Pharisees who knew a lot about God. These guys were the ones that knew all about the Bible. And that's who Jesus was talking to. They knew more about God than almost anybody, but yet they did not truly know God himself. So my first point would be many people who are unashamedly judgmental may not be true believers. They may seem like the best Christians. They may seem the most holy. They obey all the rules, right? Just like the Pharisees did. But do they truly know God? So they're, if they are unashamedly judgmental, they may not be true believers. And the second point is Christians are still fallen, sinful people. We're still imperfect, and we still make many, 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 many mistakes. <laughs> but Christian, these mistakes are opportunities for us as believers to call out our own sin. Accepting responsibility for our thoughts, actions, and words, and in our repentance, point and in our repentance, excuse me, point the lost to the glorious grace that is available to us through Jesus Christ, despite our imperfection. When handled with humility and meekness, our stumbles and falls as Christians may very well be the best opportunity we get to be an example of a true Christian to those around us. By humbly accepting responsibility without pointing out how we may feel we have also been wronged, and asking for forgiveness and apologizing to those we've wronged without necessarily seeking an apology in return, and displaying our grat gratitude to both God, the ultimate forgiver, and the person that we've wronged. So from what we've read so far, I think that we can see that we're probably going to handle a Christian living in sin differently than we would a non-believer. In Matthew 18, we see that Christians are told to confront sin in each other's lives, right? And we've gone over those steps a lot now, but you go alone, then you take two or three others, and then it can go to the church if that does not work. So we have a clear instruction on how to handle conflict and sin in the church and in, with believers in a God-honoring way that promotes restoration and peace. And now we can look at the example of Christ and read in John as we read in John chapter 8, with the woman caught in adultery, we've already gotten a glimpse of how Christ himself handled people in sin. But now let's also look at John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 5 to 18. John chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 5 to 18. And look at the story of the woman at the well. So he came to a woman... I'm sorry, so he, came to, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sichar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from the journey, was sitting beside the well. 
It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than, the, than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, and as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a well, become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying you have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. So, we see that Jesus often called out sin. He told the Samaritan woman straight up, you're right, you don't have a husband, you've had five. And the person you're with right now isn't even your husband. Jesus isn't pulling any punches here in in. He's not holding any shots. He is confronting her sin, but he did it in love. First, he told her the good news, and he told her that he could provide her with water that would make her never be thirsty again. He pointed out her need for him before he addressed her sin problems. We as Christians are still to call sin, sin. And not doing so isn't doing the lost world any favors. Matthew Paris, a British journalist and highly influential atheist, chastised Christians for, and I quote, modifying their morality from a fear of becoming isolated from the changing public morals. It is time that convinced Christians stopped trying to reconcile their spiritual beliefs with the modern age and understood that if someone, that if one thing comes clearly through every account we have of Jesus' teaching, It is that his followers are not urged to accommodate themselves to their age, but to the mind of God. The church stands for revealed truth and divine inspiration, or it stands for nothing. That's from an unbeliever. So even the lost can see that if we are to follow Scripture, then we are to call sin, sin. And to not do so is doing them a huge disservice. Of course, we need to check our motives. Is what we are telling them, is what, we're, is what we're saying, we're thinking, first off, is it true, right? Is it fair? Is it gracious? And are we telling them because we want God's best for them? Or are we trying to appear more righteous than they are? Uh, we are to approach the lost with love, compassion, and understanding that we too are capable of anything but for the grace of God in our own lives. Let's uh, look at, at James really quick. James chapter 1, verse 19 and verse 26. It says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. In verse 26, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but, de- but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Let us learn to listen and be slow to speak. A person who hears well, loves well. Learn to bridle our tongues. Don't let our religion become worthless. But use our tongues to point others to Christ who heals hearts and changes lives. When the Times newspaper put out a question to its readers asking for responses, the question was, what is wrong with the world? The winner was G.K. Chesterton, a writer and theologian who wrote quite simply, Dear sirs, I am. Yours, G.K. Chesterton. 
this kind of humility from Christians would eliminate the view of judgmentalism held by so many. When judging the lost, if we first checked our pride at the door and looked with grace and humility at others the way that Christ does, praying for the salvation of the lost more than we're concerned about the actions of the lost. We are still to call sin, sin, and to not cave to the pressures of the morally eroding culture around us, but understanding that true change comes through trust and salvation in Jesus Christ, not by demanding unbelievers act like Christians, especially when us Christians are doing such a poor job emulating Christ. So let us go out and love others. Let us call our brothers and sisters that have fallen into sin to repentance in the manner that was clearly showed in Matthew 18. And let us love the lost to stand firm in Scripture, calling sin, sin, but to handle the lost the way that Christ did, with humility and love, worrying more about the souls of the lost than their sins, because only Christ himself can really bring true heart and life change. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have given it to us to guide us and lead us, that we, we have instruction, that we're not just blindly wandering around. Lord, I pray that you would help to be a light to a world that needs you, God, I pray that you would help us to discern how to handle sin first off in our own lives, but then in the lives of our brothers and sisters and in the lives of the lost around us. Help us not to gossip or slander, but help us to use every opportunity to reflect you to the world around us, even in our own sin. Let us reflect your grace and mercy that you pour over us to the lost world that we encounter on a daily basis. On a daily basis. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you sent your son so that we could become your children. And Lord, it's because of his sacrifice that we're able to come to you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.